By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Knights of Thorn, the 10th edition, the old school magic tournament held in Deventer, the Netherlands. And we have reached the finals of this event. I mean, this is, this is going to be yummy. You know, two top decks, two top players. And uh, let's talk about the decks. Let's talk about the players. We have Gwen from Belgium, who's playing blue, white, kind of a control deck, mid-range deck. And he is taking on Avert. And Avert is playing a deck that I've called The Goat. It's got Atox in there, but also Savannah Lines. And of course, a lot of painful artifacts and direct damage and, and all sorts of stuff. But before I go into the deck decks, I've got lovely deck photos of both of these decks. I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to skip this section, check it out after the finals perhaps, and the easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there, it'll take you straight to the games. And in that same description below, you will also find more information about the rule set. We are playing according to the Swedish rules today, meaning no mana burn, no fallen empires, and only one strip mine. And for more details about the old school magic rules, check out that description and in that description you will also find a link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page because yes yes I've got my very own Patreon page at patreon.com slash Timmy Talks so if you enjoy the content that I make please consider becoming a patron of the show check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks okay and now that you're fully informed I'm going to start with the deck text and I'm going to start with the deck of the player on the left Gwen let's take a look and here we see the deck of Gwen, so I've called it just blue-white mid-range. Um, at first glance you may think, oh that's the deck, right? But then you when you take a closer look you see, oh wait a minute, it has a lot of creatures. Savannah Lines, Sarah Angel, Suchis, and also it's missing the Jam Day Tomes main, right? There are two in the sideboard, but there are none main. So it's really this, this thing, and I find it quite interesting that we see how people change the deck. How it's, uh, how the meta is shifting, you could say. So some people choose to make the deck uh, way more aggressive by adding red, you know, for bolts, for example. Other people are choosing to, you know, to do this, to just add more creatures. Other people make it creatureless, you know, make it maybe more uh, more controlling. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how people use the deck and as basically as an inspiration, as a starting point. I guess when you have, of course, blue-white as your starting point, you will always have the sword supply shares and the counter spells and the disenchants because they're super good cards. And of course, your power nine cards, ancestral recalls and that. So, I mean, that kind of, kind of makes sense. And we see all those cards coming back in here. And of course, that black splash as well for Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. But uh, personally, I kind of like to see a list like this with a little more creatures. You know, because then I'm, I'm a fan of combat. When when you play something out, your opponent usually has has to respond. Things will happen. The combat step is an interesting step. So I'm, I'm liking at least the development that we're seeing more creatures in the game. Now, um, you know, the, the most slots here are pretty much cut and dry, right? It's really what you would expect. It is interesting, of course, to, to see a Suchi. Suchi is quite good in Swedish. Why? Because there's no mana burn. So it's a 4-4 for 4, 4, 4 without a downside which makes it quite good, but in my opinion, not too good. And I can understand if you don't play Swedish often, you're used to having mana burn, you would say, ah, that card is overpowered if you play it without mana burn. But from my personal experience, I can tell you, whenever I play a Suchi, it dies so quickly. You know, you've got Divine Offering, Disenchant, you know, all that artifact removal works in it, creature removal works on it as well, and it only has four toughness, so it's still in Psionic Blast range also. So there are quite a lot of like ways to to kill it of course it does work together quite well against the abyss so if you're playing against a player with the abyss it's quite nice to play it and of course it doesn't die to city in a bottle or to a terror so th there are some pluses to this card um for me i i, I think suchi i wouldn't quickly play for main maybe i would play two main and two in the sideboard something like that um but yeah so it's interesting to see you went for a full four so it's it's quite aggressive in that sense that you have your four savannah lines that you want to deploy turn one and then you kind of maybe want to protect it with some counter magic you know play some answers out wait for the right moment to play a piece of power and really get ahead on board but the real magic is happening in your your hand right the real magic is responding to what your opponent's going to do and that opponent is avert and oh man that's going to be tough talking about that let's take a look at the deck of avert so I've called this deck the GOAT because I just thought it was funny. Atog is an anagram for GOAT. So I thought it was just funny to kind of put that in there. Now, 
Uh, Atok, of course, a creature you see a lot. Three in this deck. One red and one for a 1-2 creature from Antiquities. Second artifact. Give it plus two, plus two until end of turn. Um, you know, and I think an Atok, when it hits the board, people start to get nervous. Because with an Atok and enough artifacts, of course, you can win out of nowhere. An Atok can be very difficult to kill as soon as there are just a lot of artifacts on the board. So I think sometimes people get too nervous when they see the Atok. But usually you should get nervous because, you know, try to get rid of it as fast as you can. But of course, the deck is more than just the Atoks. There are also four Savannah Lines in here and three Suchis. Those are the creatures in the deck. And then there's just a lot of pain in this deck. <laughs> you know, I mean... Everything in this deck wants to hurt, you know, this Vanna Lines, of course, work perfect in such a deck because it's such an aggressive creature, right? You want to play that turn one, have that two potential two power of damage the next turn when you attack with it. But looking at the rest, you know, we've got three Black Vice, we've got two Copy Artifacts, we've got two Ang of Mishra. So, right, Black Vice, I always say it's like an extra lightning bolt. If you have a turn one and you're on the play, you play it, your opponent will get three damage, right? Because for every card above four, your opponent takes... Uh, a damage so if you've got five in hand take one damage if you've got six in hand take two damage and so forth um, and then of course ank of mishra works really well with black vice this is a very old combination of cards that i remember myself back in the day when we had these weird hundred card tournaments sometimes people would play these two cards together as well and uh, black vice of course with with the black vice out what what do you want to do as, as as the opponent you want to play out your hand but then there's Ank of Mishra, and Ank of Mishra punishes you for playing land. When you play a land, you take two damage. So you don't want to play a land because then you take damage, but you want to empty your hand because if you don't, you take damage from the vice. And to empty your hand, you need to play out lands. You know where I'm getting at, so you're kind of stuck in a catch-22, and I think that's really what this deck does. And to make matters worse, he's playing with a lot of direct damage as well. Four Lightning Bolts, three Psionic Blast, right? Psionic Blast, card from blue, can deal four damage at instant speed. So if we just look at the direct damage, he's got 24 points of direct damage on the board alone. You know, that is pretty heavy. Then he's also playing with two Armageddons, which I think are really good here because, you know, your Bolt is only one red. The creatures are pretty cheap. Um, if you've got an Ankh out, you've got maybe a Savannah Lines out or an Atog as well, or maybe all three of them, play the Armageddon, you know, say, okay, try to, to play more lands, you're only hurting yourself. Then you also, of course, have that Black Vice. If you play an Armageddon and your opponent cannot do anything, they're also going to take more damage. So that is really ideal. And then, of course, what works well with Atog? The Jewelry. Atog is apparently a very fancy boy. Uh, you know, who loves to, to dine at these star restaurants. And that's, of course, where the Moxon come in. By the way, this is a sick deck photo. It's all black-bordered stuff. It's insane. And I know Avert, like, his cards are, like, they're beautiful. Anyway, uh, so we've got Black Lotus. We've got all the Moxon. We've got a Soul Ring. All that is just prime chop, you know, for the Atog. It loves that stuff. Then we also see the Blue Power, of course, the, the, the Time Walk, the Ancestral Recall. I think Time Twister and Wheel of Fortune are also really good in this deck because one of the things that can happen with this deck is that you just play out your, your card so quickly because they're so cheap to cast, you run out of gas. Well, that's exactly where these like draw seven come, come in really, really handy. Time Twister, Wheel of Fortune. I am not surprised to see this deck, uh, you know, here. And it, who knows, maybe it'll even win the tournament. So yeah, this is the deck of Avert, the GOAT. We already looked at uh, the deck of his opponent, and that only means one thing. We are ready to go to the finals of the Knights of Thorn 10. Enjoy. Game number one of the finals of the Knight of Thorn, the 10th edition. And look at this, Gwen taking a mulligan. There's the fist bump to start it all off. Gwen, I believe, on the play with a blue and white control deck, mid-range deck, I should say. And he's also uh, playing the Black Splash, the Mnemonic Tutor, and the uh, Mind Twist. And he's taking on Avert, and Avert playing three colors, white, blue, and red, and artifacts as well. He's uh, got kind of an Atog deck, Atog direct damage, I've called it the Goat. That's of course an anagram for Atog, but look at this, both players starting with City of Brass, Savannah Lines, turn one. Looks like Avert wants to do something else exactly. Here's also a Mox Emerald and a Vice. Now that Vice is not going to do that much. I believe Gwen having four in hand, not taking any damage from the Vice. At least not now. He's going to draw into card number five. There's a Scrubland. And I wonder if we're going to see an attack here by Gwen. There we go. Into the red zone. And Avert is uh, taking the trade. So both lines now in the graveyard. And there's a pass by Gwen. 
Let's see if Avert uh, can find another creature, perhaps an Atok. He's playing with three of those, also playing with uh, four Suchis. So if he can find another Mox or a Sol Ring, he could also deploy a Suchi, tapping uh, the City of Brass here again. Changing his mind though, perhaps he's got another Lions in hand. And of course he's really, you know, taking his time here because this, these are the finals, you know, I mean, this is serious stuff. Both players have been playing cards the entire day, of course, if you make it all the way up to the finals, from the early morning into the late night. There is a Savannah Lines hitting the board, a pass turn. I believe it's uh, between 9 and 10 o'clock here. There is a quick Swords to Plowshares on the Savannah Line. Does mean two more life for Avert, so he's going to go back up to uh, 20. Gwen here passing the turn, missing a land drop. So let's see... If Avert can take advantage of this, tapping two here, there's an Ankh of Mishra. Okay, that's that's not, you know, you'd rather have a creature, I think, here, but okay, an Ankh, that's not too bad. Ankh of Mishra, the artifact, means when you play a land, you take two damage. But there's a quick disenchant here by Gwen. Two cards in hand, now drawing card number three, I believe. And using this time walk just to cycle it away. So, I mean, I think if you're Avert, you're kind of happy here, you know. I mean, time walk is out of the deck. You don't have to worry about that anymore. There's the Savannah Lions. Quick bolt on the Lions. Those poor Savannah Lions. So, do we now have four Savannah Lions already uh, in the graveyards here? Well, one is exiled, actually. So, three in the graveyards, one is exiled. Here we see another uh, Mishra's Factory. So he could consider swinging in with the one factory, pumping it with the other. He's going to do something else, it seems. Tapping three here. Has to take a damage, of course, from the City of Brass. Exactly. Goes to 18. Oh, a time twister. I like it. It's one of my favorite cards in old school. You know, just draw seven. It's just fun. You know, Wheel of Fortune is great. I think I like Wheel even more because I have more of a memory of Wheel. I started playing during Revised, so... I used to have a Wheel of Fortune myself, and it was just always fun. You know, when you would play it out, even if you were behind, you could get back into it. And this is a pretty early uh, time twister here. There is that one card, though, there. I believe it should be shoveled in on the side of Avert. I don't know if you see it. He probably doesn't see it at the moment. Anyway, both players now uh, getting ready to draw their new seven. So I wonder what they're going to do with that one card when they notice it. So seven in hand here for Avert, and that's number eight. So... Let's see. Yeah, and I think Avert now realizes, wait, hey, wait a minute, where's that card coming from? And uh, both players here discussing here what to do. And uh, I did, I did um, put the speed up a little bit. It's a 120% speed instead of 100%. The reason is that there were a lot of longer plays here in the finals, which makes sense, but it's a bit more pleasant to watch if the game goes a little bit faster. Not too fast, of course, but just a little bit faster. And uh, what I wanted to say here is that when something like this happens, like a mix-up, you know, like Avert having that extra card, that uh, the players themselves kind of decide, okay, how, how do you want me to fix this? Do you want me to just put the whole hand back, which is fine, and shuffle again, or just as one card? So in this case, it was just his one card. Uh, we saw a soul ring, by the way, by, uh, by Avert, and of course Gwen taking damage here from the, from the vice. So going from 17 to 14. Let's see what else he can do. Eight cards in hand now at the moment after the draw. There's a Volcanic Island. And again, a Savannah Lines. They just keep coming. Of course, they've all been shuffled in back, except the one that got uh, exiled. We see that uh, under the uh, Time Twister there in the, on the side of Avert. I mean, Avert's deck is, is, is full of bolts, so I'm, I'm kind of expecting a bolt here on that poor lion, but another factory, wow. Could also consider just exactly animating both factories going in. I believe that's what he's going to do. I mean, Avert's deck in this matchup is more aggressive than Gwen's deck. So Gwen tapping one, you're going to go to 13. Are we going to see a bolt here? Or, so, oh, I should say Swords to Plowshares. Not playing with bolts, of course. I'm mixing the decks up, so. He's going to target that one Mishra's factory. First takes the damage from the City of Brass. Here we see the prize card of the tournament, by the way. Not quite sure why that came flying by, but anyway, the Mishra's factory is gone. 
So that should mean two more life here for Avert. So he would go up to uh, to 20. And the Gwen here not blocking. So uh, he's taking three damage. That's why he, that is why he's going down to 10 here. And hey, the price card is back. <laughs> In the middle, okay. Yeah, this is something in case you're not familiar with old school magic tournaments. If you win the tournament, you always get a card signed by all the players. And a tournament is usually named after a magic card. And in this case, it's the Knights of Thorn. That's the, the poster boy of this tournament. So you also see a Knights of Thorn signed by all the players, including me. My signature is somewhere on that night. And then if you play the tournament again, so if you go to the Knights of Thorn 11 next year, then you have to have this card in your, in your deck. It can also be in your sideboard. Anyway, Gwen here uh, kind of quickly passing the turn. Just playing a land and pass. So still has that one lonely Savannah Lines. No Suchis, no Sarah Angels. Of course, doesn't have enough mana to cast the Sarah. This is a time walk, I believe. A lot of glare on the card, but yeah, it's a time walk. So that is not too bad, I guess. Is he gonna animate? I think that's the big question. Is he gonna animate the factory and attack? I think that's also what Avert is now thinking about. Using the soul rings, so he would think he's, he's just animating both, perhaps? Or, well, I think you only want to animate one, right? So that you can pump the other. Exactly. So he's just going to attack because then if Gwen blocks with the lion, he cannot. Um, Avert can pump it, so you don't have a trade. Yeah, and this is this is kind of annoying here. Okay, there we see a psionic blast. Taking care here of the uh, Mishra's Factory does mean two more damage for Gwen, dropping to seven. I mean, he's quite low. If you compare that to the life total of, uh, of Avert, he's still on 20. Remember, Avert is playing with three Psionic Blasts and four Lightning Bolts. So, uh, you know, it's getting really dangerous. And now, of course, he's taking on his extra turn. Is he going to find one of his Suchis? Or an Atok would also be quite good on this board. Here's a Plateau. Gonna tap two. There's a psionic blast. Ooh, he's in bolt range. There's the bolt. End of the road. Yeah, I kind of already felt when the moment he was on seven, you know, oh, this is getting risky. And that's why it's so hard to play against like the type of deck that Avert is playing because it's got an aggressive creatures and these aggressive artifacts like Ank Advice and then also the direct damage. So it's very uh, a, a deadly cocktail uh, to play against. Anyway, this is just game number one. So both players are going to dive into their sideboards now, depending what they want to use for game two. And we will catch back up with them in game number two. Game on number two, here we go. Gwen on the play, starting with the Sapphire and a Tundra. Pretty good start, passing the turn. Let's see what Avert can do. Also a Tundra into Savannah Lines. So this is his perfect turn one, I guess. And uh, Gwen here uh, drawing a card. Let's see what he can do. Passing here. Oh, that's not good news for Gwen. Again, having issues with mana. We saw that in game one as well. That is very unfortunate for him. There's the swing with the line. Gwen dropping to 18. Are we gonna see a black vice? That would be that would be pretty brutal. Other options could be Ank of Mishra, Atok, of course. Let's see what he can do. Looks like he's gonna tap two. So what are we gonna see? Changing his mind though, untapping them again. So just no, I thought for a moment he was passing, but he's not playing a disenchant on the Mox Sapphire. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because we already saw that Gwen missed that land drop. So attacking the mana base here seems to be a valid strategy. Look at that. Another pass here by Gwen. Oh, this is so bad. I mean, you can win and lose a finals fine, but you don't want to lose it because you're getting mana screwed. That's one of the worst things that can happen. Here's a time walk. And Avert actually also quite light here on Lance, but at least he's got the Lion. He can attack now again. Put Gwen here on 14. He's going to tap two more. What are we going to see for two? Looks like he's got... Is that a Chaos Orb there in his hand? It's kind of hard to see. Yep, there's a Chaos Orb. So next turn, if Gwen cannot find a land or and or a Disenchant, he can start flipping on that land. That would be devastating here. Okay, finally, there's there's... This is pretty good. Library of Alexandria, he can use it. Wow. That's quite a land to top deck. That can really get you back into it. Now he needs like a Mox and a Disenchant. There's the Mox. 
There is this in Chan. Wow. Some power play here by Gwen getting completely back into this. And I guess he already had the library. He drew into it probably and wanted to go back up to seven. There's the attack. So he's now on 12. Yet at Loa, that's a problem now for Avert. All of a sudden the tables have turned and yes, Gwen's already on 12, that's true. But if your opponent has an active Loa, you're in serious trouble. There's the pass. Of course, he's now gonna draw into card seven, I believe, exactly, draw card number eight. I mean, Gwen's in business. We've got a real game number two here on our hands. I was a little bit worried at the start with the missing land drops of Gwen. Gonna play out a volcanic island, seven in hand, I believe. I do think if you're Gwen, you wanna do something about the lion, because remember, Avert's deck is full of direct damage. If you go below 10, you've got a problem. Look at this. Okay, there is a red elemental blast from the sideboard. Countering the psionic blast is quite important. And I think if you're Avert, you just now wanna play as aggressive as you can because your opponent is drawing twice as many cards as you, so you have to play aggressive here. There's the attack. Gonna put Gwen on 10. Can he put some more pressure on the board? Like a vice would be fantastic here against the Loa. Going through his hand again, of course taking his time, but I think he doesn't have a vice or else he would have slammed it on the table. Does look like he's got some options. There's a Suchi. Are we gonna see a disenchant perhaps here? No, of course, of course, Gwen is gonna draw into card seven here and then card eight with the Loa. So a disenchant uh, wouldn't have made any sense. You wanna play the disenchant now. You don't wanna go to five cards in your hand, of course, with the Loa. So I believe he's got eight cards in hand at the moment. I wonder what he's gonna do. And okay, there we see a disenchant, yep. Also a Swords to Plowshare, so taking care here of the board. Avert now on 22. Yeah, it's looking really good all of a sudden here for, uh, for Gwen, you know, he's got a lot of cards. He's still on 10, which is pretty healthy. Look at that, he's going to five in hand. There's the Lotus, is he gonna crack the Lotus? Nope, he's not. Perhaps he's got a, some kind of draw seven or ancestral recall in hand. <laughs> that he is doing this. There's the untap. No play in the upkeep. So I'm curious what Gwen's uh, plan is here, going kind of off the Loa trail here. Signals to me that he's got an Ancestral Recall, or at least a draw seven. Let's first see what Avert can do here. It's his turn at the moment. He is on 22, but he needs to find something new to put pressure on, like a Lion or another Suchi, or one of the Atox that we haven't seen at all here in the finals, game number two. Avert, of course, up a game. Looks like he's gonna tap two here. There we go, that's a disenchant on the Lotus. I like this play, because you're kind of forcing Gwen to say, okay, if you want to use that Lotus, do something with it. And look at this passing the turn. I am so puzzled. I have no idea why he went off the Loa. He had his reasons, I am sure, you know. I mean, Gwen is an extremely experienced player, so there is a reason for this. And of course, we cannot see his hand. But uh, I am a little bit surprised. Now he's got six in hand, so he's kind of going back up to the seven so he can use the Loa again, I guess. We saw a counter spell there on Suchi, by the way. Let's see uh, if Avert can find something else. There's an Armageddon. Ho, ho, ho. Look, and it resolves. No counter spell. Wow, I think this is a really good moment in the game for Avert. I mean, this is really a setback for Gwen. There's an underground sea for him in the pass. There's a factory, okay. And a pass. Wow, I didn't expect that Armageddon to resolve, to be honest. 
There's a tundra in the pass. Avert here, uh, is he going to attack? That's the question. He is going to attack for two. Are we going to see a disenchant? Yeah. It was a risk, of course, from Avert, but I think knowing that Gwen was on 10, it was kind of worth it. But I think if you're Avert, you're very unhappy now because you, you lose a land and you lose your only threat. So you're really behind at the moment on, on Gwen again, who's kind of found lands and he's uh, building back up. He also has his own factory now that he can start attacking with the next turn. I wonder if he does. We'll just have to wait and see. We've got the uh, City of Brass and Sapphire for Avert here to work with. Looks like he's got three or four cards in hand. Kind of difficult to see. Tapping two here. Taking a damage. Going to go to 22. There's a balance. Ooh, all these heavy cards. And there's a counterspell on the balance. There's another land. I think it's a plane. It's going to tap five or oh, four. For a moment, I thought we were going to see Sarah Angel. We're going to see Suchi instead. Of course, Suchi also a great card here for Gwen. I mean, if Avert cannot do anything. Oh, look at this Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Gwen here losing his own balance, by the way, but that wasn't very useful for him. Balance, of course, being a great card when you're behind, but not when you're ahead of the game. So uh, beautiful, beautiful magic here. So we're seeing a, a Wheel of Fortune. Avert here checking uh, the cards in hand here. Seven. And I mean, I understand why Avert played it out, but the risk here is if you now pass the turn back to Gwen, I mean, he's going to have eight cards in hand, a lot of lands. It's pretty risky. There's a Mox Pearl. I mean, if, if, if I have a, 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 a Swords to Plowshares, I would play it now. Because next turn, uh, Gwen is going to untap with maybe a new a counter spell in hand. And he can counter it away. Of course, I don't know if he's got a Swords. But I'm just saying what I would do. And I also wonder, by the way, how many counter spells are in the graveyard of Gwen. I believe two. And I, I think he played four counter spells in a mana drain, if I'm not mistaken. There's a Mox Ruby. There's a Soul Ring. I wonder if he's going to swing in for six. You know, I would consider swinging for six. You've got enough mana sources, I think. So if you lose the factory, it's not that bad. But I think the two extra damage are worth it in this stage of the game. Exactly going to animate swinging for six. Are we going to see a response here? I think if you're Avert, even if you don't have a sword, you want to pretend to have a sword here. So you want to pretend that you're thinking about it. Here we see him asking about the graver. Probably going to look at the counter magic. So he checked the graver, looking at his hand again. And he's going to take the damage, going to go to 14. Are we going to see something from Gwen here in second main? More pressure? I can also imagine that maybe you want to keep two blue open. Are we going to see a Sarah Angel here? There's a Sarah Angel 4-4 four, four flyer hitting the board. And now, of course, Avert is in serious trouble. Remember, his balance already got countered. Wow, he did have a Swords to Plowshares. Amazing decision here by Avert. Not to swords to Suchi, which is something that I would have probably done. You know, I just didn't, I, I would be, I don't want to take six damage. Uh, but that would have meant that he didn't have, of course, his swords anymore for the Sarah Angel. And now he also plays out the Ancestral Recall, knowing that Gwen has stepped out. So there's some good magic here. Can he find, for example, a Psionic Blast that he can now play on the Suchi? Or, or of course, play a Suchi of his own. I wonder, I wonder, what is he going to do? There is a Black Lotus. Does he have perhaps a Brain Geyser? Cracking the Lotus. There's a copy artifacts. He's going to copy the Suchi here. Having one blue floating, I assume. Is he going to do something with that one blue? 
So he's got three now. Are we going to see a psionic blast? No, a divine offering. So could have just tapped the uh, the Mox Pearl here. Not quite sure why he's untapping and exactly just tap the Mox Pearl. You have enough. And of course, he gains four life from the divine offering. So he goes back up to 19 This or 18. This game is very swingy. I mean... At one moment, I think uh, Averett is winning. Then I think Gwen's winning. Now I think Averett is kind of back into it again. There's an Atog. Finally, we've got the goat on the battlefield. So this one, two creature from Antiquities. Second artifact. Give it plus two, plus two. It has found its way back, ladies and gentlemen. Because we didn't see it the entire finals. For a moment, I thought, did Averett board it out? That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, let's see what Gwen can now do. I mean, staring down at an Atog and a Suchi. And I mean, both players have so many answers in their decks. Tapping. There's another Sarah Angel. So she is back. And let's see. What else can Gwen do here? It is, of course, a little surprising that he tapped both of his Tundras here to cast the Sarah. But I guess he's going to use all his mana anyway. There's also a Suchi here hitting the board. So, I mean, he's back now. You know, Sarah Angel on the board, Suchi on the board. Ooh, look at this. Lightning Bolt on the life total. 11 here for Gwen. That is an interesting move. Very aggressive. I wonder if he's going to attack with the Atok now. I mean, he can sack the artifacts. I mean, I don't know if, 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 if that's something you want to do. So Avert now, of course, uh, in the tank, as they say. There's a volcanic island. And I still kind of wonder why he played out the, the bolt. I'm sure he had his reason, so maybe he's kind of seeing a line here. Gwen on 11, and he's tapped out. So this is really the moment for for Aver to do something. He doesn't have to worry about any counter magic or instant speed removal. He can just do his thing. Tapping three here. There's the Psionic Blast. Taking care of the Sarah Angel. Dropping to 16. Gonna tap three. Oh, another Psionic Blast. And we see Averett here dropping to 12, of course, after that uh, second Psionic Blast. So I'm expecting him to attack here. Exactly. Gonna go in for five. Is he gonna sack some artifacts? He is. Wow. He's gonna go for it. That means nine points of damage, I believe. He's gonna drop to two. Oh, man. The, if, if he would have had enough mana to also activate the factory, he could have sacked the factory and, and, and win right there. Remember, this is game three. This is really tough for Gwen. I mean, he's on two against a burn deck. Well, I mean, it's more than just burn, but... Man, four bolts, three psionic blasts. Just a pass here from Gwen. Oh, he does have, of course, a strip mine to strip the factory. But uh, this is looking really good for Avatir animating. There's the strip. So he's going to eat it up. So we've got the Atok, which is a 3-4 and a 4-4. Has to, of course, well, has to probably is going to animate the factory to use it as a blocker. And this is, uh, this is risky. Okay, there seems to be some conversation about the strip mine. I... I mean, I think you had to strip it, right? There, there's nothing else you could have done. Gonna animate here. Gonna block. And, oh, he is gonna survive. There's the swords to plowshares. So he is gonna swords here to Suchi, right? And that would mean that... Oh, there's a bolt, though. That's it. That's the game. Avert winning here. Wow. And what I like here about Avert is... Then he first attacks and just waits. Can I kill him with combat damage? Also fine. I'm just going to wait and see. 
what he has in hand, if he's going to burn through his resources. And then at the end, I'm going to do this bold play. And uh, yeah, wow. Avert Winnier, this is his deck. I guess the title of the deck was good. The GOAT, the greatest of all time. At least the greatest of Daventer here for tonight. And he's winning the Knights of Thorn number 10. Congratulations, Avert, on winning the event. And of course, also congratulations to Gwen for making it all the way to the finals. That is also quite an accomplishment. And I would also like to thank you for watching these series right here on Timmy Talks. And if you've missed something about this, um, any match of the tournament, make sure to check the description below because there will also be a link to the playlist of the Knights of Thorn number 10. For now, thank you very much for watching. And before you go, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you for your support. Please leave a like, share this on your socials, and comment on this video. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. Talking about moving forward, we also have our very own Patreon page. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks. And if you enjoy uh, the content that I make, please consider becoming a patron. It already starts for just $1 a month. And for that dollar, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. And you can also play in the Timmy Talks online tournaments and other events. And your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video, including this one. Let's go to the end scroll. Ik het als fikker te somber gezien.